everyone and welcome to Corvette Nation presented by Mid-America Motor Works. I'm Maria Prekogis and I am in a very special place today where the history, the tradition of seven generations of Corvettes come together. I'm here in Bowling Green, Kentucky, not far from Interstate 65 where Corvette lovers from around the world have been coming for 20 years. They've all been living the dream right here at the National Corvette Museum. Gary, we are surrounded by these gorgeous cars in this fabulous museum and all the people behind it in the Museum Hall of Fame that are really behind the Corvette. How did this all start? Well, it started way back in 1989 as the National Corvette Restorer Society guys got together and said, we need a place to keep all of our documents, all of our records, and to have to store the, the original cars. So they said, we need to build a museum. And so they started looking for a place to build it and looked at several different locations and ended up in Bowling Green. And how did you get here? You've been here a long time. I, I have. I was actually the president of our local Corvette Club when it first started as a, as a thought in an annex here. And then uh, I was a volunteer for many, many years and then was asked to come on to, as a board of directors. And I did that for about a year and then took a full-time position here and been here almost 12 years now. Well, it is simply amazing. If people haven't seen them, I invite them out. It's so well done. How can you improve upon it, and what does the future hold? Well, of course, in 2009, we added 47,000 square feet to the building we originally started with, so we're about 115,000 square feet now under roof. We keep about 80 to 90 Corvettes in here at all times, special, rare, one-of-a-kind cars. We're also now building a motorsports park, so you can bring your car here and enjoy the performance the car can really do for you just right across the interstate here. But we're always improving uh, exhibits here at the museum, looking for new ways to get interactive and make it more user friendly. But we're always looking and always hoping to do better. Well, you do, and it does just keep getting better and better. Thank you. Thank you. Adam and I are in front of what is my favorite exhibit in the museum, the Mobile Gas Station, or as I like to name it, the C1 exhibit, because it is my favorite Corvette. I can't blame you. I love it, love it, love it. Let's talk museum. It is gorgeous, it is beautiful, but there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, absolutely, we're, we're not just an attraction. There's a lot of facets to this museum. Uh, from not, we do raffle tickets uh, to where you can purchase uh, the chance to win the new Corvette. We have our library and archives, uh, build sheets, and you know, various parts of memorabilia of these older Corvettes, uh, even up to the newer Corvettes. Uh, we have our, our Corvette store, which is a big part of our operation here at the Corvette Museum, our Corvette Cafe. We have facility rentals, and then uh, what I do is I, I'm responsible for our collector car insurance agency called the NCM Insurance Agency. This man has so much knowledge in his head. Don't, don't tell Bill, but you could rival him a little. I don't know about that. We won't tell. It's our little secret. What's the best thing you hear about this museum? I think it's, it, it takes people back to their, their history, to their childhood. You know, their neighbor owning this, this 1962 Corvette, and the first time they lay their eyes on it, just brings back so many memories, and that, to me, is the best part. Well, it just keeps getting better and better, and like I said, the knowledge, I'm just astounded. Thanks for your time, and I'm going to go get in one of my cars. Let's do it. Okay. Corvette Nation, presented by Mid-America Motor Works. Pursue your passion here. Kerbeck Corvette, the nation's number one Corvette dealership. And by the NCM Insurance Agency, protecting your passion. Now I'm just hanging out here with my peeps at the National Corvette Museum. That's Dave McClellan over there, former Corvette chief engineer. And that's Dave Hill, former Corvette chief engineer over there. You guys want to say anything? Okay, cool. 
Uh, as you can see, I'm surrounded by a bevy of Corvette V8 engines, and each one of these has had a significant role in the success of the Corvette, starting way back in 1955, when that engine, the 265 cubic inch Chevy V8, debuted not only in the Corvette, but in the entire Chevy product line. It was small, it was light, compact, and how successful was it? Well, every drag racer and hot rodder in the world wanted one of those engines in their car when that engine was released. A couple of years later, 1957, the 283 cubic inch Chevy V8 debuted, and that one is fitted with the ever-familiar Rochester fuel injection. 283 cubes, 283 horsepower, and as the story goes, that engine makes closer to 290 horsepower, but the marketers at Chevrolet said, you know, 283 cubes, 283 horse, that'll have more impact. So that's what they went with. There was an original LT5 engine that debuted in the King of the Hill Corvette in 1990, and an experimental version of that engine with twin turbochargers making 650 horsepower. Well, a whole variety of engines here that make horsepower and have added to the Corvette legacy since 1955. Even a few transmissions here, the original Borg Warner T10 that arrived in 1957 and a later model ZF six-speed manual transmission on display as well. But once again, take a look at all of these engines and this display and their success in the Corvette. And you can draw a straight line from that all the way back to that little guy over there, that 265 cube mouse motor that started a whole new generation of Corvette V8 power almost six decades ago. <laughs> so anyway, if you don't install this cam correctly, you're gonna... Oh, sorry. Having a little conversation with Zora. Zora Arkestantov, you've probably heard of him. Well, here at the National Corvette Museum, there's an entire exhibit devoted to all of the great accomplishments that this man is responsible for in the history of the Corvette. He's called the father of the Corvette for a good reason. This is a gentleman who, in 1953, came to General Motors, but already it had a full life. He was born in Belgium, raised in Leningrad, and during World War II, he helped his family escape from the Nazis in Germany. Then in 1953, the same year that the Corvette was built, as soon as he took over the engineering department in the Corvette project, good things began to happen. 1955, the V8 engine. 1957, four-speed transmission and fuel injection. 1963, the first Stingray. We saw big block engines come in in 1965 and on and on and on. Lots of great race cars were responsible because of this man here, the SR2, the SS. Do you remember the original Stingray racer? Yep, that was another one of Zora's projects. Up on the wall over there, you'll see the driving suit, the driving gear that he used to wear when he was doing research and development driving for the Corvette back in the 1950s and 60s. But how cool is this? The only Corvette that Zora Arkis Dantov ever owned is on display here. A 1974 coupe that he had painted a special blue theme, and it's a 454, as you might expect. The last year, the big block engine was available in the Corvette. Oh, a couple of other things. The suit that this life-size mannequin is wearing, that's one of Zora's real suits that was donated by his wife, Elfie, before she passed away. And in the display case behind me and that gold cubicle are the ashes of Zora Arkis Dantov by his instructions permanently enshrined here at the Corvette Museum after his death in 1996. I am here with Richard Rogers inside the National Corvette Museum. All the way from Orlando, Florida, you are here for something special. You just bought a new C7 Stingray, and this is all part of the delivery program that the museum offers. Yeah, they offered a great program where you come pick it up, see where it's built, tour the factory, learn a lot about the car, just have a great day with a great car, new experience. Well, and this new C7, everyone loves it. You obviously love it. You just purchased one. Why Chevy and why the Corvette? Uh, love Chevy. Love the brand. That's my third Corvette. Wanted to make it special. Wanted one of the new ones. So uh, came here to pick it up. It's great. And today you're driving it all the way to Orlando? We're taking it back to Orlando, Florida. Back so. home. Well, it should be a very fun drive. All part of the experience here at the National Corvette Museum. Bill, we're in front of the one, the one, the one and only 83 Corvette. 43 were made, there's only one left. Why? You know, a lot of people don't even know there were 43 made. If you ask a lot of people, hey, they didn't build a 1983 Corvette, did they? Ooh, yes they did. <laughs> but it never really made it into full production. And the reason is this, if you take a look at a 1982 Corvette and a 1984 Corvette, 
the difference is astronomical. I mean, they started with a clean sheet of paper. New body configuration, obviously the style is different. The way they built the bodies is different. They went to a one-piece molding construction, no more bonding strips. They went to a base coat, clear coat paint, which had never been done before in a Corvette. They also have an LED instrument cluster. That's a first. These are all technologies that really hadn't been perfected in the automotive world as of yet. So with a car like this coming to market, Chevy wanted to be sure that they got it right so that they had all of the bugs worked out, and that took extra time. So the 83 car, and it had to be put off to 1984. This 83 actually has the proper wheels that came out on the production vehicles in 1983. Someone here at the museum about 10 years ago, about 2003, said, huh, I know where those are, I've seen them. But the best story I love about this car is, since they were destroying them all, some of the employees at GM said, let's hide it. So they took it apart, put it back together, painted it, so it just wasn't in the eye, the direct line of sight to any of the GM, you know, big shots. So <laughs> it's here, which is great. It was at the factory for a while, though, before it got here. Right, and that's an important part of the story. Why did they destroy those other 42 cars? Well, that goes all the way back to when the uh, manufacturers were building concept cars throughout the years. Those cars, by and large, didn't have VINs or vehicle identification numbers, so they couldn't be registered. And there were some liability issues if somebody got their hands on one of those cars and went out and drove it and had an accident, <laughs> call in the lawyer. So that's why they had to crush those other 42 cars, and that is the only survivor. Breaks my heart, but honored to be here with the one and only 83. Oh, I thought you meant me. <laughs> you too, honey. Oh, thanks. This is the library and archives here at the museum. It was a long time coming. Uh, this is what the museum started out to be. Uh, we have approximately uh, one million bill sheets. We have a bill sheet for every Corvette built in Bowling Green from 1981 to the present. And we try to stay updated. I go over to the plant once a month and uh, get the ones that have just come off the line. So we stay pretty current. Yeah. We have periodicals. Um, we have tried to gather two copies of every Corvette magazine published. And we have pretty well reached our goal on that. We also have service manuals for various years Corvettes. Uh, I get calls daily from guys wanting to know how long is the drive shaft in the 1989 Corvette? I have to go back and dig. That's what I love most about the job, is digging and finding answers to questions. We have the original teakwood steering wheel sent in to the U.S. Patent Office to be patented. Uh, the designer of that steering wheel's widow donated that to the museum. And uh, we're proud to have that, among a whole lot of other memorabilia that people do donate. I have been doing this, uh, I started to work with the museum before the museum was built. So it soon will be 20 years. Enjoyed every day of it. Welcome to this week's Lance's Corner. I'm here with Erwin Croy and this beautiful 63 Z06 Corvette standing right next to us. I love this car, Erwin. Tell us a little bit about it and tell us one thing. Why did you end up buying this car and when was it? Well, I purchased this car in 1985. Um, I was looking for a Z06, the heavy duty brake and suspension racing package for the 63s. This came out because they wanted to get more into racing and compete at Sebring and Daytona and other major races. I found this car in uh, Virginia and uh, purchased it. And uh, I had it restored 
And when it came to the paint, there was a problem because Sabring silver was very rare paint. It was the only uh, color that was an option in 63. It was $80 option. And it's very hard to duplicate. But when we restored it, we found the original Sebring silver paint, and we used it. It's a great car. I mean, I just love the color combo. As you said, Sebring silver, it just stands out. And the red, boy, does it ever pop. That's my favorite color combo right here. Yeah. I love this car. Yeah, I, I love it too. They made uh, practically four or five silver red uh, Z06s in 63. You're so a lucky man. It's pretty really rare. Are. Thank you. It's funny, the car should probably have stickers on it and go racing, but it's so cool to have it in its stock configuration exactly how it came from the factory. Yes, this car really was not a race car. It may have raced uh, local events, but uh, it wasn't an all-out race car, which it was lucky because it was saved and not destroyed. Oh, it's great, and I love the fact the radio delete and what have you, it's just cool. Yeah, so. radio, heater delete, and of course it has the uh, 360 horsepower fuel injected engine. I love it. I love everything about it. I love the fact that it stops quickly. I love the fact that it flies in a straight line, but it also handles well. It's a great Corvette all around. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it with us. My pleasure. In the late 19th century, the area where I'm standing was one of the last settlements of the old Chisholm Trail cattle drives in Texas, before the trail crossed the Red River into Oklahoma Territory. Now, the settlement was, and still is, called Nakona, Texas, population about 3,000. But the only drives through Nakona now involve cars, and while this is what rush hour in Nakona looks like on a typical weekday morning, it wouldn't look nearly this calm and quiet if all of Pete Horton's Corvette collection took to the streets at once. Uh, really kind of research it, and it's a good thing to do, and it helps this town a lot, too. The it Pete Horton refers to is his massive car collection that has almost literally exploded onto the scene in downtown Nakona in the relatively recent past. Just two years ago, Pete Horton had no Corvettes. I was in our condo. We, we stay in New Orleans quite a bit and uh, watching TV and uh, commercial come up said Vacari car auction uh, in a few days and it said it was at the Mardi Gras World. That was about three blocks from our house, and I thought, I think I'll go down and watch that. I've never been to one. But just in case, I called my secretary and had her fix me up some credits. I said, I might buy me something, and, but I went down there, and it was fun. My wife went with me. We had a ball, and we bought 16 cars. <laughs> we bought 16 cars. You heard right. Pete Horton went from being a non-collector to having 16 classic cars in one day. That's a blistering zero to 60 on anyone's stopwatch. But the collection didn't end there by a long shot. Pete Horton is methodically filling several buildings with classic automobiles. And while his tastes cover a variety of brands, it doesn't take long to see that he has become a Corvette guy. A rainbow assortment of vets, most in the C1 and C2 categories, is displayed in the main downtown museum. They include a white 63 split window coupe, formerly owned by Texas actress Sandra Bullock, and a red 65 Roadster that Pete bought a while back. It came with an unexpected bonus. Inside the glove compartment, he found an owner's manual signed by none other than Zora Duntoff. Everybody loves a Corvette, even people that don't care about cars much. You drive down the road, it turns their head, and uh, especially, I really, really like the, the 50s and 60s. There's just so many of them left, and especially like the 53, there's probably 150 left, if that. Whatever that number is, Pete has one of them. 
bearing a license plate denoting its VIN 261, this first-year Corvette occupies a place of honor in the front window of the museum. Pete thinks he has 45 or 50 Corvettes, but forgive him if he loses count. Last year, he bought 25 fully restored vets from one seller in one day. At an on-site Nakona auction in spring of 2013, he paid more than $400,000 for just two Corvettes, a rare unrestored Big Break 62 and a long-hidden 63 Z06. The 63 is in the museum, and the 62 sits in a remote warehouse with dozens of other Horton cars. It's patiently awaiting a planned expansion of the museum when it will take its rightful place among the other Corvettes. To me, they're just, uh, they're just, everybody, when they see a 50 or 60 Corvette, is just, they just fall in love with it. It's just uh, special. It's not like something else. Uh, Corvette's a Corvette. Hey, this is Bill Stevens for Maria Prekages and Michael Brown. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Corvette Nation.